let's let's try and uh, make this one long. Yeah, let's make this long. All right, yeah. guys. Just like maybe put some bread on to bake or to rise. Yeah. Okay. Just get ready for a long haul here. Do some painting so you can watch it dry. Yeah. Because every time we say, "Hey, let's make this a really quick one," we'll get through these topics fast so we can get to bed on time. We Next wind up we talking know. for yeah. three hours. <laughs> Absurd. Anyway, hello everyone. Hello, we're back. We're back. Um, Sunday, twenty eighth of January, two thousand eighteen. Walk of the week. Yeah, so we made it back out to Rolling Hills County, uh, County Park. Yeah, and it's been way too many weeks since we've been out there. Very long time, but it was a gorgeous day. It was so. Yesterday was it was fifty. Yep, but cloudy least. and overcast most of the day. Most of the day, but then it got weirdly sunny in the late afternoon, which meant somehow that our house heated up strangely. It was miserable. And then so at night we were trying to sleep, and even it was in the high seventies, <laughs> it was too hot inside. <laughs> yeah. This is January, by the way. Yeah, exactly. We usually don't have this problem in January. And so it was very confusing. But anyway, today it was a little cooler, but it was uh, very sunny. Very sunny. Just gorgeous. So we got out, we got, and we walked a couple miles, I think. A couple miles, yeah. Yeah. It's a really nice, varied park. Yeah, there's a, there's a variation. You're going through wooded areas, you like prairie areas, you mm-hmm. know, and there are some mile hills, you know, yeah. it literally is rolling hills. Rolling hills. So. And the, um, um, Lots of playgrounds, and in the summer they have a water park. Yeah, we were alongside, uh, uh, like disc golf. Course. Yeah, that's a disc, disc golf course on the soccer fields. Yeah, and plenty of space to take a bike out and really open it up. Yeah, so uh, sometime when I can get my road bike fixed up. Yeah, you know, and there's nothing really wrong with it except that it's been sitting in storage for seven years. <laughs> Um, oh god over seven eight years almost yeah i mean think about that right yeah we moved to saginaw eight years ago yeah this summer yeah and you hadn't ridden it in a while then oh it's a beautiful bike i have a yeah. i have a very nice old well it's now uh, it's now vintage, it's now vintage <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a Le Mans steel frame road bike yeah um i got it in the 90s and um yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, just to put this in perspective, you considered selling it at a yard sale when Pam and John Pilch still lived in Michigan. <laughs> God. Because, it's you know, you hadn't just, been riding it. Uh, it's been like, yeah, been I, I, I talked to, I tried to uh, post it on eBay and I had a local person come and look at it and he offered me like 200 for it. I'm like, you kidding me? Jesus. Yeah. You know. yeah. He was trying to convince me that it wasn't worth much of anything. We're like, it's. It's actually a, a steel, a, a good steel frame bike. road bike. It's yeah. anyway, it's a very nice bike, but um, it it needs you know it's going to need tires and cables and probably a, a chain and a good tune up, and a good tune up, and yeah. you know probably the various rubber and plastic parts are uh, are just <laughs> aged, as you would say, needs replaced. Yeah, it hangs up. It hung up in our garage in Saginaw the entire time we lived there. So sad. Yeah. No one ever stole it, which was nice. But, well, uh, you know, you gotta stop trash talking Saginaw. Yeah, oh, it was not, actually safer than Ann Arbor. It, so it seems like it. How many armed robberies? Well, that's not true. There are a couple of police shootings. Yeah. A couple of shootings. Stuff happened, but like our neighborhood in Ann Arbor versus our neighborhood in Saginaw. Yeah, much safer. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, when I lived on the old west side in Ann Arbor and even on West Hoover, I, I never actually locked my door, yeah. which maybe was foolish, but I was I was never robbed. Mm-hmm. In Saginaw, there were crimes, like petty crimes of opportunity. People oh, would yeah. rifle cars looking for change, change and yeah. stuff. But um, we never, we were told when we, when we bought the house that the previous owners had had like break-ins and stuff, but that yeah, never, never happened. happened. No. So, or anything like that. I think someone stole a ladder from our garage. Oh, yeah, that nice ladder. Yeah, that's the only thing that I've not been able to. And I think someone push. stole our our steel trash cans, like our. Oh, they told actually, scrappers totally stole our steel trash cans on trash day. Right. Like they took the trash out, left it at the curb, and took the trash can. <laughs> I was just for scrap metal, yeah, yeah a little I was bit floored. Like, whoa. Right. But as far as like 
what people usually think of as crime. It just our yeah. our neighborhood was not was not really yeah, just not like that. No. Yeah. Anyway, I don't mean to trash talk Sagana. We got off track already. We're already in the weeds, like in talking the weeds, about looking around my trying to find bike. my elbow. Where's the, there's a path to <laughs> citizenship somewhere here? <laughs> no, we're talking about our walk this week. We're talking about our walk. How did the kids do? Uh, largely well. Yeah. Two of them did not fare well. <laughs> so if it was like a, if you go by like a, there was a plurality a plurality of, of success. Uh, yes. <laughs> but two of them uh, were just, oh gosh, poor Pippin. Pippin was really bad today. He just wasn't like he never. He's got, really having a tough time. He never got off on the right foot. I don't think he ate a good breakfast. Well, now, is it? Is, now, what was he doing when he was up by you? Because he was like trucking along for a while. Pippin. Pippin. Because remember, at the beginning, Mary was dragging his feet oh, right. and begging he, him to go okay, back to the car. Okay, he was doing okay. You know what it was? Okay, so here, here's here's everyone's uh, er, the diagnosis of diagnosis. everyone's problem. Last night, yesterday, we had a, a, a birthday party for baby Eleanor, who turned yeah, one. Turned one. Um, she actually, it was Wednesday, but yeah. we celebrated it yesterday. And we had a cake from Costco. The Norman's, the, Norman's cake. <laughs> the chocolate cake you can get at Costco. Oh. Actually weighs, I kid you not, seven pounds. It's obscene. It's a massive chocolate cake. It's really good, and it's It's not very expensive. It's obscene. Um, Anyway, so the kids pretty much, they ate a ton of that last night. And then ice cream. Well, and we had several, we had seven different kinds of ice cream, like some some, uh, cashew, some almond, or some cashew, some coconut, and some some milk ice cream. Some dairy milk. Dairy-based ice cream. And they ate a ton of that, too. Yeah. And then... um, This is a side note. Um, we, We like food a lot. We like food a lot. Yeah, so we have a varied... Um, celebration diet whenever we yeah. party. Yeah, there's lots yeah. of food. So yeah, that's why there was so much like cake and ice cream. It's yeah. like our thing. So, but um, as a result, I mean, they're they're really not used to eating that much sweet. So when they get a chance, and they binge. it's just binge. And then they felt, you know, terrible. terrible. Well, we felt terrible too. <laughs> I kind of almost hung over. Right. Yeah. And, and then the first thing, when Pippin got up, he was rummaging through the kitchen before I got out of the shower and ready to out of the bath and ready to that was cook. Mary. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Pippin too. Oh, Pippin too. Okay. So Mary had like a pound of chocolate cake for breakfast, mm. and then Pippin finished off the salted caramel um, cashew ice cream. Right. And so it's no wonder his blood sugar crashed. Crash, and he was miserable and yeah, dragging his feet and <laughs> cursing us out every. Ten feet. And then, of course, you know, I made a breakfast after that, like bacon and pancakes, but he didn't want to eat any of that because no. he was just eating a pound of cake. <laughs> and ice cream. So, Pippin had to be almost dragged through the entire walk. <laughs> like, well, the second half. Because he then, was trooping along. Yeah, first. and then Mary, I had to carry him for at least, yes. it was like a you mile. You actually had to carry him the last on mile. On my shoulders for a mile and a half or yes. something like yes. that. Which I have to say, he weighs 40 pounds now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a trivial. So uh, yeah, I can taking. still do it, but man, my neck and shoulders are stiff, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard on my knees to carry that kid for a long yeah. distance. But um, it was a good walk. We uh, yeah, yeah, no, we make it sound so bad. You make no. it sound so yeah. It's, it's not it wasn't that bad. It, it wasn't that bad, but it's just we get sick of if any kid is throwing a tantrum, it can kind of ruin an outing, you know, yeah. or melting down. It doesn't ruin it completely, but it can kind of like, you know, this like the smile is wiped from everyone's face. Although uh, Veronica, Sam, and Joshua just kind of like walked far enough ahead that they didn't have to hear it. They didn't have to hear it. Yeah, right, they, so they were, would just run ahead and kind of play. They were out of earshot and do like play sword fighting with their sticks because everyone brought their little walking stick and they would do that. Yeah. Or um, while uh, Mary and Pippin were fussing at you, Veronica would hang back and chat with Eleanor and I. So it it, it was actually really quite pleasant. It was a quite and, and I was overjoyed to get out and walk a decent length of time, like really use my legs, you know? Yeah. I just, that hill at the end was fun. There's a, there's a hill at the, at the last part of the loop oh, that we yeah. did. Rolling Hills has a, has a big sledding, sledding hill. hill. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Yeah. And it, you know, especially with a 40 pound pack, <laughs> it's kind of, it's a good workout. The hill is a, a, you know, my heart rate was 
nice and elevated. It was an aerobic uh, workout. Aerobic activity. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's been a, a like a we're crammed a lot in this weekend, yeah, and we're so good. we're feeling a little bit fried. So yeah, we spent most of yesterday afternoon like cleaning up the house Binge to get cleaning. ready for a party, which is uh, which is was good. I mean, it was good to do that, but yeah. it's always like trying to keep the kids focused on chores it's not so easy right. to either do the chore or yeah. just get out of the house if someone else can get out of the, either yeah either do it or get out of the way but we had chili we had um a chili bar basically yeah a little chili bar and cake for, for dessert and ice cream and then um and then today we got out to another sunday socialism get together yeah and met some folks was reasonably that good. was at the um Cultivate. Which one? Like the Cultivate. Cultivate Dipsonity. Which is, an, it's literally a non-profit cafe and uh, and beer garden. And I'm yes. still trying to wrap my head around like what their business structure must be. But uh, Yeah. I, I think the non-profit business in the U.S. is like this response to the, the vacuum of, of um, um, social decency. <laughs> that, that basically... People don't want to be associated with for-profit restaurants and whatnot Yeah, it's anymore. kind of gross. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's a lovely little place. Uh, yeah. Right. The food's great. The food's good. The yeah. coffee's good. We had a pour-over of Kenyan, Kenyan pour. uh, yeah. some kind of... Uh, and they, they've got a big roaster on the premises. And yeah. So It was very good. I drank yeah. mine just straight up. Straight up. Yeah. I, I added a little bit of almond milk, a little bit of sugar after oh. I finished the first half. I think if I'm using it's whiskey terminals, that's neat. Neat. <laughs> yeah, I drink, drink neat, but yeah, as you were. Black, you just drink it black. Yeah. Um, yeah, the um, black coffee, I like the flavor. It can often be a little bit hard on my stomach. I get a little nauseated oh, if I have, because yeah. some, sometimes it has a, uh, this this one was pretty mild, but sometimes coffee has a fair amount of acid in it, kind of yeah. sets off my stomach. Well, I, you know, if you know what you're doing, your coffee should not be high acid. Yeah, it's true. But yeah. a lot of times people... I, this was, yeah. It wasn't really. I just, it, it was easier on my stomach to add a little bit of almond milk. And, yeah. Anyway. So that was uh, Sunday socials. And then we took a walk. And we took a walk. And we came home and, had, oh, we went to mass. We went to mass. We got everyone to mass. We made it. So it's, it's just, uh, we're feeling a little fried because in part... Like we're starting the podcast at like nine forty five PM on and Sunday night. On Sunday night. And we've been planning all weekend to do it. Yep. But I still gotta edit it and get it posted yeah. and all finished up before I go to sleep and I got to get up at seven fifteen. So <laughs> But that's how much you guys mean to us. Yes. Anyway. So we're here. So we're trying to figure out um better ways to to do everything that we try to do over the weekend i feel like i want a three-day weekend just every weekend every should weekend, be three I days three days I'm, i need three days you know everything's half finished <laughs> yeah um <laughs> and i have to wait till next week and you know then there'll be other things right anyway so. we also uh we saw a movie friday night oh yeah so yeah so what, that's something we're watching what are we watching so, yeah, so, so uh, yeah. I didn't have it much to talk about. I've been reading stuff, but I don't have a book report or anything. But watching, so this is a movie called Silvio. Mm -hmm. And I read about this because I was reading a different review of something in The New Yorker, and it made a reference to this, and I looked it up. So mm -hmm. this is a movie that never had a major theatrical release. Um, direct video. Well, no, it's a it's a festival film. Oh, direct festival. Yeah, so it, it's been shopped around at different film festivals, mm -hmm. um, and it probably will never have a major theatrical release because right. it just won't um, attract a a big audience. You yeah. know, to, it's not going to be shown at your megaplex on no, an IMAX screen. Imagine, you know, maybe we we're wrong, but I can't imagine it. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine, but it's a uh, so um, so. I read about it. And after I read about it, I was like, okay, we have to watch this. <laughs> so we wa I watched it with the kids last Wednesday night, like uh, sight unseen. Mm -hmm. I had Which is not, always a little risky. To be I honest. had not previewed it, and it was an art film, and it was unrated. Anything could so happen. So I'm like, mm, is there going to suddenly be like naked people or, you know, <laughs> swearing, or, swearing or, you know, or what? explicit sex or whatever. But uh, no, in fact, there's nothing in it. That I actually felt bad about showing the kids at all. There's no, no cursing to speak of. Nope. There's one violent scene where there's a fight, mm -hmm. but it's 
uh, it's presented as as unnecessary violence, you right. know, and then there are consequences to it, you know, right. and it was, and even so, it's not a, it's not glamorized, like it's not a big, no, it's super, not, it's not a superhero right. fight, it's like people literally rolling on the sidewalk fighting and then, you know, then someone gets way. hurt and it looks, right. it looks painful and, um, and awful. <laughs> right. So there, it's in a moral context, you know. And a guy, a guy gets hurt. So it's unrated. Uh, it's actually it's low key story. It has these surrealistic elements. It has a lot of kitsch in it. Oh, so much kitsch! Yeah. And, uh, did we tell them the name of the movie yet? Silvio. Yeah. And I will put a uh, link to it in the show notes. I've got a, a bit of a review. Um, the kids laughed uproariously the first night. You actually they, were in the bedroom trying to finish something. Oh, my God. Finish yeah. some paperwork for Eleanor's appointment. Forms. And made in my existence. Forms. forms. And so you couldn't join us, but you heard the kids just laughing. Laughing, laughing, yes. laughing. So um, the premise of the film... <laughs> is that there's a mild-mannered gorilla living yeah. and working alongside humans in Baltimore. Yeah. And if you are willing to accept that, uh, it kind of flows from there. There's no CGI. The costumes are not elaborate. There's no motion capture. You know, it doesn't have Andy Serkis. Uh, it's not a Planet of the Apes kind of gorilla. Nope. It's a very low budget. Silvio is played by a guy in a gorilla suit. And it's even like, it's just half a gorilla suit. Right. <laughs> it's like just his head and hands most of the time. Yeah. Although there's a scene where he has his shirt open, and for that scene, he like has fur on his First chest. chest. <laughs> it's uh, so absurd. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, the guy that plays the gorilla is actually one of the writers and directors, a guy named Albert Burney. Mm -hmm. But the credits list Silvio Bernardi, which is what it says on his driver's license next to the picture of the gorilla in the movie. As playing Silvio. As playing himself, yes. What's so, that about? I don't get that. Yeah, they, like I said, they took no pains whatsoever to make him realistic. Oh, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he doesn't speak through the entire movie. Nope. He sort of grunts well, and sighs does. a little he bit. He speaks through a computer when he speaks like two or three times. Yeah, there are only two or three scenes where he does this, mostly at the beginning and the end, mm -hmm. where he types out something on a little computer keyboard, and then you hear a voice synthesizer reading it. Yeah. But mostly they don't rely on that no, through the film. Not. Like they convey only the smallest bits of information with it. Yeah, so yeah. he just, through most of the film, people talk to him and he kind of, nods or kind of grunts or t does a head tilt or you know shrugs or uh, one one of my favorites uh his friend asks him so how do you like your eggs and he does like this, this little, little hula dance, dance. <laughs> he's like oh scrambled, scrambled. okay yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious <laughs> yeah veronica had a comment which is that to her the film was perfect and i think oh, what yeah. she meant by that is that it has this internal logic and then it completely follows through on it, where it takes the filmmakers, right? right. They don't shy away from becoming absurdist, right. you know, where, where it's going to go absurd. It's a little slow in a couple places. There's a couple scenes that don't yeah. work that well. Um, do you think so? Which ones do you think of that? So he's supposed to be like, he's wandering away from work, and he's wandering in nature, you know, because deep down he loves the natural world yeah. more than the human world. But he's in Baltimore. Right. And so, like, the natural world, though, showing him walking through is just kind of like a gray looking, like, you know, the scenes aren't, aren't attractive, you know. Oh, right. Like, right. the natural world act that he's attracted to doesn't actually look attractive in these oh, scenes. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And then he's, he's, uh, he there's this clip where he's approaches some horses and he's petting the horses. The horses actually look a little weirded out by the fact that a he's man in a gorilla suit is petting, petting their. <laughs> like, huh. What's that about? Yeah. We're supposed to see it as oh look he has this, you know, connection to to nature and natural animals and whatnot. But they're like, what's going on? Well, no, I I just thought that was more of the absurdity, more of the surrealism. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I guess I can go on that. So, and then I asked myself, like, watching this, like, what does it mean? What are the filmmakers trying to say? Is this about race relations or... Or what? Black folks trying to tolerate well-meaning acts of solidarity by white allies? Is it about social media? Is it about 
attitudes towards hip hop culture and all this, but really like, no, it's no. like, it doesn't have any deep message though. If you want to take a message out of it, right. the story arc is about this, this gorilla who wants to be an artist and doing the art that he cares about. He wants to do the art that he cares about and right. loves. And the art that he cares about and loves is, uh, are these little puppet shows he does, right? Which uh, the quiet, quiet moments yes. with Herbert Herpels. <laughs> and Herbert Herpels is a little plastic guy with his arms like fixed in, in this position. vertical upright position. Right. And he just kind of waves it at the camera. And he does these ridiculous his little, shows, little, his little shows with clever video tricks and whatnot, you know. And that's 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 his thing. And that's his thing. And he's done hundreds of little clips right. with Herbert Herpels and he wants to he wants this to be his art. Right. You know? But, but that's he, not what pays the that's bills. That's not what pays the bills. And so he winds up on like a community access cable show where uh, he's doing a segment called What's the Ape, Ape Gonna, Gonna Break? Break, where he takes a baseball bat and basically smashes stuff from... Uh, the thrift store. From thrift stores, <laughs> and the audience loves, loves it. it. People loves are it, calling in, you know. So it's literally like this conflict about getting paid to do the art you love versus the art that will pay the bills. Yeah, right. And also the way that like the audience will claim ownership over an artist. Yeah. Like, yeah. no, this is what you do. This is who you, you are. are. Do it for us. Yeah, you come know? on. And it's like, shakes his head. No, no. no. Anyway. So that's, it's, if it's about anything, it's about that. It's about, yeah, it's about that conflict. This, uh, this conflict of the artist, which but maybe is a little twee, you know. I have to emphasize, if it's about anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's largely just delightful and entertaining. It's, it's just a funny, very low key. Right. movie and uh it maybe it makes more sense if you know that um silvio began life as a series of six second videos on vine yeah i you never I hope, really watched yeah, vine. i never really got watched vine or, or i never got those. deeply into vine but there were some real vine fans and some yeah. real hardcore producers on vine is this still a thing it's not they went they went under unfortunately uh, yeah that'll happen but i remember sharing vines with sean hurley and other folks on facebook and oh, twitter okay. yeah and um the really funny vines were really funny mm -hmm. within a six second format that's right and yeah, that's silvio the, the guys who originally started doing silvio vines mm -hmm. there were 800 of them 800 <laughs> Sylvia Vines. Well, I guess they... So they told they actually rhythm. his whole backstory, mm -hmm. including really uh, truncated versions of a bunch of these little puppet shows. Right. Right, including like little indications about his his childhood, his, his childhood, upbringing his and all this. Right. Right. So I guess then they had enough of a following that they ran a Kickstarter to fund this movie. And off they went. And off they went. Yeah, no, it, so, it, it works, I think. It, it works, works, it yeah. works. It's a, it's, uh, it's a fun movie. It's, um, yeah, it's not for everyone. It's not a blockbuster. They're not going to, no. you know, it's not going to get, it's not going to compete with Blade Runner and Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> no, nor should it. Nor, nor should, should it. it. No. Totally different um playing field honestly mm -hmm. oh there is some, th this this idea that silvio really really wants to make quiet art mm -hmm. that, it's something i really identify with because my early podcasts and all that were always like a lot of them were sound collages oh yeah that I, lasted like 30 minutes of sounds ambient sounds edited together yeah, I never quite got those. Yeah, you never got those. Nobody yeah, did. Yeah. But that was what I wanted to make. That's what you wanted to do. And that's still, I, I still like to listen to them. And I still like the idea of creating like quiet, slow art that's very subtle. Um, and the audiobooks were something like that. Oh, yeah. Although I got the audiobooks. Where the, those were but, great. Where, but where the story takes a long time to unfold, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's like, it's just kind of the antithesis of what, like, the market wants. Wants or will bear. For, will yeah, bear? For, for entertainment. So, yeah. anyway, that's, that's my, 
my notes. You enjoyed the movie. I did. So. I was very glad to watch it. Yeah. Very silly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So <sighs> we've got, is it three articles? Three articles. And um, we're going to try and get through them pretty quick tonight so I can. <laughs> Edit, no, we're taking a long time. The show and we're get we're to taking bed. like no, hours seriously. and hours, an hours hour, and one hours, hour, one hour each. We're going to spend an hour on each of these articles because yep. that's what the world needs. Yep. Um, Slow food for thought. <laughs> so the first article, um, I, I was almost too outraged to even speak about this. I, I think I posted this, but um, this is a slate response to this woman in Sacramento, California that went into her absurdly late postpartum checkup with her OB. Yes. Like she's four months postpartum. It's the first time she's seen. First time she's seen her IB. Uh, I, uh, I, oh. OB. OB because he kept rescheduling. Kept rescheduling. And, and she comes in. She really needed to. You know, women need to be followed up days like days after Afterward. birth and and you know and if they have any concerns then frequently, frequently after right. that and and i know I, i've always been slightly irritated yeah by the follow-up care because i have to, I have to get up and go somewhere i gotta do something etc right. but i understand why it's standard <laughs> if you did have an issue like you're bleeding internally or you know or you know, you my blood pressure out of control, or your blood, infection, you know, all those things. You can have eclampsia like after after you know. you're delivered, yeah. and someone needs to check on that. Yes. Right. So, um, yeah, I remember. I forget which child it was. I was. They wouldn't let me go because I wasn't 24 hours after delivery yet. That was wrong. Was that wrong? No, because this was like like the second or third time. So it was Sam or Joshua. I okay. think. Okay. Well, with Veronica. It was so you like recovered so fast, Very fast from the birth, and the birth went so easy mm-hmm. that we were like ready to go. And it's they're like, like okay. "Oh, you should stay." And the, you know, but there was nothing wrong with her. She was as healthy as a little horse. She had a perfect apgar. Yeah. You know, yeah. like she was and, fine. I was, and fine. you were fine. And so we're just, can we just go home? We just go home. And I, I remember just standing we, there. We kind of had to talk him into it. I had my bags packed, and the nurse is like, "You know." You'll be at 24 hours until just wait the 10 minutes. I actually can't release you, that doctor. <laughs> just just sit down for 10 minutes yes. and then you can go. <coughs> so, uh, if everything's really yes. running no, smoothly, they haven't all gone that smoothly. They, but, they haven't all yeah, gone that smoothly. Right. But when everything's going smoothly, yes. the it can be a little bit irritating. Yes. That said, um, there's a reason this is the standard of care. Right. It's because things, things can, get, can go wrong. Can go wrong and go really wrong. Quickly. Quickly. Yes. So the idea that you haven't been seen for four months, that's outrageous. I mean, really, it's just, that's outrageous. And I'm sure the OB's like, well, she had a problem, she could have called. Like, I, yeah, really? <laughs> well, if you're honestly, have, having been a person with anxiety and depression who still lives with anxiety and depression, if you do have a problem, sometimes you can't. Can't call. You cannot bring yourself to reach out to people. That's part of the. That's part of the problem. The fundamentals of the of the condition. Right. So if you've got an appointment scheduled and you're supposed to show up, maybe you'll show up. You know. Yeah. Um, so but she goes. If and- you just feel bad, you'll do everything to talk yourself out of it. Like, oh, I'm oh. okay. I'm not. I'm okay. you know, I don't yes, want to trouble I, anybody. Yes, I have these horrifying suicidal thoughts, and I and I I'm crying. You know, twelve hours a day, but I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to bother anybody. No. <laughs> you know, I don't want to inconvenience anyone. Yeah. So she goes into the doctor finally at four months and tells the nurse practitioner that she's um, she has symptoms of postpartum depression, mm-hmm. and she's got a, a good support system at home. She's not in danger of harming herself or her baby, but right. she needs some. She needs something. She needs some help. She needs something. So medication and or treatment um, to get through her depression. And so the nurse rushes through her pelvic exam, which for the record is not something that should be rushed. No, no. If you, <laughs> it don't rush. You, you don't, exam. you don't give uh, your, the, the woman a chance to relax. It's just going to be really it's uncomfortable, be bad and all, uncomfortable all, around. all around. And then and you don't, you don't want your OB or your nurse to like, look nervous, look nervous <laughs> <laughs> and be like rushing. Like, Oh, it's like that. Uh, no, so she rushes through the pelvic exam, tells her she has to go review her symptoms with the doctor, and leaves. And um, apparently she leaves and calls the cops somehow. 
Yeah. Somehow this yeah. turned into like a police encounter. Yeah. And um, the cops come and they're like, huh, well, we can't take her and the baby with the car seat. So, <laughs> this is so we'll give her strange. like a two car police escort to the emergency room. This is, it's just demented. And then they leave her in the care of a security guard. She was expecting that, you know, maybe a social worker would come and talk to her. Or, uh, honestly. Or, or maybe someone would give her a screen, you know, like a, like a question. We'll give her like a, know, well, a, no, I think what, it, a lot of people don't know what to expect, right? Right, right. What, you're not expecting whatever, police intervention. Whatever, she didn't expect this. She didn't expect police intervention, yes. you know? yeah. What she probably thought was like, I'll tell them I'm having this problem, and then they'll tell me how to solve it. Or maybe they'll like refer me to someone. Right, maybe I'll get a referral. I'll, fi- I'll find some way to solve this problem today. Yeah. So, right. she, so they take her to the hospital, and they leave her in the care of a security guard who then waits for her, with her for an hour. When they say the hospital, they're talking about a, a mental health was it this? I think it was. Was it a mental health? Clinic? I thought it was the emergency room at a hospital. Well, maybe, but they were treating it as as a as a psychiatric, like you know, admit, like a psychiatric uh, emergency. Admit, yeah, right, right. Um, where she's you know can't be left alone and right. and just carrying her four month old baby with it. This is this whole thing, okay? Right, right. Um, and then she just waits and waits and waits and waits, and then she waits yeah. more, and finally is His seen, ERs aren't set up to really no not really prioritize this kind of thing because you know no one's bleeding out right and finally she's seen by a uh like a psychiatric social worker who gives her some uh handouts with some phone numbers and sends her home and this is 10 hours later yeah and if that process had gone a little bit differently some aggressive um psychiatric uh what's the name the psychiatric nurse attending or attending yeah or not attending but like the psychi- attendees or yeah they're like orderlies no one uses they, that word they anymore. might have decided to do an involuntary 24-hour uh, oh involuntary 24-hour hold yeah yeah uh, I, they in might which case, be her, longer than that, that they, they might have given her baby to her husband to, or cps but to probably to cps yeah because you know right she had to be in the hospital and then her daughter's <clears throat> in foster care right. for, uh, you know, Whatever. until they can sort this out. Right, right. And, yeah, they have the right, if they think she is a, a danger yeah. to herself, there's some there's an involuntary process, you know, process where you right. can be held for observation or... I think it's up to 36 hours, actually. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, it, it made, yeah, I, I don't remember the details, but... Right, and I think it also varies by state. Yeah, but this could have happened, <clears throat> yeah. And well, this it could seemed have spun, like maybe it was going to happen. This really, as it was, it spun out of control, right? Right, right. But it could, this could have really spun full out of control where, you know, some serious permanent harm was done. And as it is, um, you know, this has turned in her, into her. This became public knowledge because of a Facebook post she uh, made yes, yeah. detailing the experience. Now it's written up in Slate. And largely, it looks like it's spurred a conversation or spurred a conversation about postpartum care yeah. and how it should be better and how it really fundamentally sucks here yeah. in the U.S. Um and you know that's great, but how many women for whom this really just goes completely off the rails is a good open question. Yeah, I don't have the answer to it. But the thing in this little article here that I really appreciate, they articulate how um, in China it's it's fairly common, um, less so for the more educated women in the city. Mm-hmm. It's less common, but it's a fairly common cultural practice to call, do what's called sitting the month, where you literally stay in bed for 30 days after giving birth, and you have two or three female relatives and friends um, prepare all your food, bring you your baby, yeah. manage yeah. everything for yeah, that period of time. The sitting in bed, literally staying in bed part is probably not good for your health, yeah. but the, 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 the companionship, and help getting established with a new baby. Oh, it's, it's is huge. Invaluable. It's huge. But well, and, yeah. And you know what? If this is a traditional practice they've had, I'm not entirely willing to second guess it. But um, I'm, I'm guessing 
they wouldn't have this as practice if women routinely well, died doing it. I no, but say. people need to move around after. I mean, oh yeah, blood like, clots. You all can this have abilities. blood clots. You can, you know. So I mean, so they, they I'm just be, saying that she should be walking. You know, like well, that's but, that's the traditional practice in China. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like, there's a, there's all kinds of little details about like you're not supposed to uh, you're not supposed to get get uh, use a fan. Oh yeah, yeah so it gets a little strange. So but. it gets a little strange. There are all these sort of unusual details that I think are traditional details that don't translate into modern life. If that makes right, sense. Right. So I, I don't know if that's one of those, but that's actually somewhat of a norm. It's a cultural norm. Well, in China. The, the idea that you'd have a month of support. Yeah, that's a that's a cultural norm. Is is it would be great. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's what they do. Um, at least, at, at a minimum. And the right. article talks doesn't it talk also about how how fast American women are rushed back to work. Two weeks. Yeah. Many women go back to work two weeks after giving yeah. birth. Yeah. Um, and that's you know they're at work two weeks later. And they're newborn. And they're newborn is, is in daycare. They um. Oh, they talk about it's it's unbelievable to me that well, we tolerate Well, I consider it child abuse. Well, absolutely. And, yeah. But hey, and not on mom's part. I wouldn't consider no, mom's. No. Term. Yeah. No. Mom's not. I don't think mom's down with this typically. No, no, she usually just wants to eat and keep a roof over her head. Yeah, that's usually yeah. what's going on. It's it's like she has a gun. Mom has a gun to her head. Yeah. Um, in France, women. This is really amazing. It's hard for me to even imagine. Um, women get a, uh, a pelvic floor training, ten to twenty visits standard in the first few months. So that's like once or twice a week. Yeah. They get pelvic floor work, so they don't end up with prolapses and various yeah. incontinence so and strength and everything right yeah um yeah because okay. now i think a lot of people don't realize that that's extremely common the, like for pelvic floor pelvic floor prolapse to have and various you know, incontinence problems and, with urine leakage and all that yeah and just sort of having all those muscles function again right is an exceedingly common problem yeah well it's you know uh, ask a man to poop a bowling ball and then see how well, see it, how does. well it goes. You know? <laughs> Afterwards, see how everything holds together. Yeah, Let right. us know on that. Yeah. Um, and then what was there was another example she gave. It wasn't just France and it wasn't China. Uh, do you remember? Did you did you read this one all the way? I did, but I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, in the Netherlands that. Um, they basically send a postpartum doula to your house. Yeah. So you don't have to go anywhere. Well, some of these countries, too, they also have this standard box of baby goodies. You get That's it. Finland. Yeah, you get, a, right. you get a baby box. And the box the baby can sleep in, and then it's like a yeah. layette. Yeah. So it's full of little baby clothes, towels, burp cloths, and all these things all stuff, that you need, right. which, you know. Which and then it also becomes a little crib. A little crib for And baby. so, like, generations of kids have spent their first few weeks of life actually sleeping in this cardboard box. <laughs> and you can, you can say no thank you to the box if you prefer. Sure. And they give you, I think, $150 instead. Yeah, so it's if you've it's, had like if you've got all the stuff you've you got need. all the stuff and you're all good right but um yeah the a lot idea of people that take it a lot, it's most, most people take it they choose good stuff they choose good stuff it's quality stuff it's not um it's not a diaper bag and formula <laughs> no god no <laughs> which is the only thing they hand out free in the u.s oh my god <laughs> yeah a bag full of expensive uh disposable diapers and a starter can of of enfamil Good luck. Yeah. Get, Good luck with your nursing. Yeah, make sure you feed your baby this formula so your milk dries up and then you have to buy formula. Oh, so sorry nursing didn't work out. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, your baby can be fed because we're here. We're here with this toxic, uh, smelly... God. It's a good thing we don't have a bigotry about breastfeeding. Oh, no, I have a bigotry against formula, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that stuff was... Um, you know, babies that are fed formula, God, their poops, is, their poops is like toxic waste. It's really a bre- breastfed baby. Their poop is like it's kind of like you filled the diaper with um, stone ground mustard, mustard or something. Yeah. it doesn't smell that bad. Yeah, it no. is kind of yellowish. It, it's kind of gross looking, but it's, it looks it's, gross. But it's you can wipe it up. Like it, the smell won't actually make you you vomit. Make you a know? gag. Yeah. Yeah, but the 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 Formal formula diapers, stuff. So can I be don't. Hard. You know, it's if women who can't breastfeed, they need to find. There needs to be alternatives. They've, there's got to be a better stuff. Well, to yeah. feed them. 
there, there is. Yeah. And th- we have a lot of cultural shame around it, a lot of cult- cultural um, yeah. uh, baggage around it. But before capitalism provided women with formula, yeah. um, we had wet nurses right. and milk sharing. Right. If you were wealthy, you hired a woman. Yeah. And if you were poor, you shared with your female relatives yeah. and neighbors. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't weird, and it wasn't bad, and it wasn't you know it wasn't sick, dirty and sick, dirty and, and bizarre. That. Yeah, it, it was yeah. feeding children is what it was. Right. So now, even even um, even if you need an alternative to human milk altogether, there's yeah. got to be a better way. Oh, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, no, no truly. Because this stuff, the the stuff that's in this formula, it's these these trash vegetable oils and weird hydrogenated it's things crazy. that just. You know, it's hard. Yeah. And I know that, um, I knew that I was raised on formula, and I'm sure that <laughs> did did Probably not do good, th- didn't help my mental health yeah. when I was already prone to anxiety and depression as a kid. I'm sure mm-hmm. it didn't help my brain development any. Yeah. So, anyway. It's a good thing we're not bitter. It's not bitter. Not bitter at all. <laughs> uh, that said. That said. This, um, I think reveals the, the problems that we have in uh, American childbirth yeah. in stark relief. Yeah. And there it's it's um I'm sad to say I'm not actually surprised. No. I'm angry. Yeah. But I'm not surprised. And and the problems are bigger than just oh you know what we just need to we just need to have a a, a better procedure, you know. Yeah, no, no, it's bigger than that. It's, it's bigger than that. Because basically um she's being punished for needing care right well we do that a lot yeah that's a, that's a this social isn't norm the only here. this is a huge example. social norm of punishing people no we, we for needing care know, the helpless and weak get you know get punishment get punishment because you know they're helpless and weak this is like right. some kind of and we see it as a moral good for us to do so right yeah. it's really absurd people who are in need get lectures and and you know a beating if we can do it and the other thing we do we is we always try to separate them so for example uh we draw a very fine distinction right down the middle of like the working poor and those yep. that are just a little more working poor mm-hmm. are eligible for food assistance or whatnot oh for some kind of yeah. but you know if they're just make one dollar more another 30 bucks another they dollar get nothing more. you get nothing sorry and so we have built in a system where we we create resentment right between the poor and the very poor right and so we you're... create those categories in fact mm-hmm. by that by this by means testing by this means testing right right and it's really it's really pernicious. And by the what's called the benefit cliff. Right. And it's not just for food, it's for all kinds of things. All kinds of benefits, right. Yes. No, no, no as soon as you make too much money. For housing. For housing, for, for um, cash benefits. Right. Et cetera. Suddenly, or for health care, suddenly it just goes away. And the rhetoric, uh, you know, especially on the right, but on the left too, mm-hmm. around um, people needing benefits is always about the, sh- the shaming. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, honestly, character and culture. And you need to understand that these are public goods. These are public goods, and this is public this money. This is a baby. Yeah, right. <laughs> you baby. know, even if we're going to say, "Well, screw the mom; she can go do, what do, she has do to whatever." Do. The baby needs a healthy mom, right? And that baby, maybe you know, your doctor one day or. or- <laughs> Maybe your garbage man, or your garbage man, or but let's say you you know you hope that that baby grows up not um, crazy, not criminal, mm. and not you know not going to be someone who kills you on the freeway, or kills you in an alley, or anything else. Like anything that. else like that. I mean, really, you and I think our hopes are actually much more affirmative than that. Yes, and we don't realize that we have those affirmative hopes. We assume. Right. That, you know, you were fed every day and you got a good night's sleep. Right. And you had a warm, dry bed and you went to school every day and you had fun with your friends. And this is the template of your experience that you're drawing from when you walk into the store. Yes. Just to buy something. Right. And to maybe, interact with anybody. To interact with anybody. In any setting. So we're, we're just assuming that as neutral and as basic and as a baseline. 
And yes. for many families, there's no way for that to happen. To happen. Yes. Right? So if you understand what's actually happening, you would expect to have school shootings every other day. You would expect shopping malls to get shut up <laughs> if you actually have a good grasp of what actually happens day to day in people's yeah. lives. You would expect people to be dying on the freeway because they're so exhausted they're from so working exhausted three from working. jobs and right. living on monster energy or whatever. Right. But instead, we have this affirmative assumption of the basic sort of baseline experience that people have and are living with day in and day out, unaware that we're doing everything in our power as a society to strip that out from under people's feet. Yeah. So, um, so it's not just birth and delivery and early childhood where this is a problem. It's this social ethos that we have about how we care for each other. Right. Or we, we, or we don't. To. That we don't. And that... Um, any need or, or um, weakness must be punished to really produce the best people. Yeah, yeah. Because if we punish the ones that aren't weak, well, you don't want we'll to just encourage make people to, exactly. to ask for help. I mean, it's yeah, expensive. It takes yeah. time. It's, all, it's all money. Problematic. Yeah. Number two, you want to talk about the um, this uh, divorce? Why don't we do that one last? Last, okay. Yeah, this next one should be relatively short I think. it's kind of exciting actually even though I, I think yeah you were fascinated by it too right yeah okay. no this is amazing so it's hunting for the ancient lost farms of north america by can i even see i can't see annalee knew it um and this was what is this i think it's it's from ars technica ars technica yeah yeah but it's um it's mostly her, her talking about the work of some other some other scientists people some scientists so um, and actually, I think one particular scientist. Um, right. Yeah. Um, archaeobotanist Natalie Mueller. Take a second to unpack that term. Archaeobotanist. Botanist. Right. So she's an archaeologist and a botanist. She's looking into... Um, Hunting for the ancient... Ancient plants. Like, yeah. And, and her specific interest is looking at evidence of what plants humans cultivated for food. Yes. Many years ago. And this is this is what is so this is mind boggling. Yeah. For me. I just mind boggling. Yeah. Um people have lived in the United States for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. like since European set settlement, right? Right. And um roamed and changed over the landscape radically. Right. Yet she's going around the Midwest right. and the South into caves and finding Caves and sheltered areas and pe places where humans, like, you know... Human settlements. Native settlements were. Native, uh, na you know, ancient native settlements were. And she's finding caches of seeds that have been there for 2,000 years. Yeah, caches of seeds and just and living plants that are just out of place. Yeah, they, they don't belong here. How'd this get here? They were brought there. Yeah, they were clearly yeah. brought there. And there's, so there's a... Because of its misplacement that there's evidence of its cultivation mm -hmm. outside of where it would normally would have been its normal range yeah but i it's just i can't even wrap my head around a cache of seeds staying in a cave for two thousand years i can't like find <laughs> you know socks i put away a year ago <laughs> to me this is a little bit like the dead sea scrolls right yeah you know i mean these these um, scrolls that are wrapped up in leather and they're actually they're disintegrating right mm -hmm. and so they have to be extremely carefully pried apart and read using you know electron microscopes Very and all this stuff. Tools, yeah. um, but we can still the fact that we can still read these surviving manuscripts at all is amazing. It's my it's really just mind boggling yeah. for me. But no, I mean, it's the, think about the the impact we're having on the land. You yeah, know, and what we're leaving behind, what so we're leaving behind, bones. you know, so <laughs> <many chicken> <laughs> um, but unintentionally, right? Like what thing, you know, we know a lot of what we're leaving, but what things are people going to, you know, if they're people or if anyone's here to study us, right? Um, leaving behind unintentionally, all the evidence. plastic. Oh yeah. God, I'm mortified by all the plastic. Uh, so, but this is this is hopeful and encouraging, I think, in many ways because. Um, apparently, we used to eat a lot of foods, a lot of plants, and cultivate them and, and develop them, breed them for particular characteristics, and we don't eat them anymore at all. I did. 
Remember I was kept making a goose foot soup or lamb's quarter soup? Lamb's quarter. Lamb's quarter and goose foot are the same plant. Oh, okay. So one of, so one of them is something we did eat. And that's yeah. actually really good. Yes, it is. It's, it's pretty yummy. very high in vitamin C. You blend it up with a fat or something. It's very, oh, very tart, but the combination is like sour foods like that. They make you salivate. And they're just... Uh, and they're loaded yeah. with vitamins. Yeah. yeah. And this is what I didn't quite realize. So that same plant, the lamb's quarter, goose foot. So the young shoots in the spring, uh-huh. I would take and make soup with and have it salad. Yeah. When they go to seed, those seeds are like quinoa. And you can use them like... Oh, really? A grain, like a starch. Okay. So you collect those seeds and you... Yeah. But she, there was likewise. a phrase she used towards the end of the article um, where she's saying, so, yeah, we don't eat these foods anymore. Mm-hmm. Imagine if humans just sort of, for some reason, just decided to stop using wheat. Yeah. What a big change that would be. How huge a transition right. that would be. And that's what happened. I yeah. mean, like the, their their staples, some of There's their staple food. foods just kind of fell out of favor. They you disappeared, know. stopped being eaten. But it's also, I think, really encouraging because it just points out to like, you know, if we do stop, have to stop eating wheat. It's okay. Or corn. It's you okay. know, And corn is, is a huge source huge. of calories, just cheap calories. oils, cheap, cheap sweeteners, cheap everything. You know, it's just, it's like some vast proportion of calories in the American diet come, come from, from corn. corn. It doesn't have to be that way. No. And, and frankly, it would be good if corn went away. It would. In, in the way that Americans use it. it in the, be, yeah, it would be good if corn went away. In terms of the larger impact on the biosphere, the need for for fertilizer, for chemical fertilizer so and all that, the, the factory farming impact mm-hmm. of corn cultivation. Right. Yeah. It's and and these plants, they were growing them mm-hmm. because they could be cultivated. They could be cultivated and domesticated here. Here and without, you know, they didn't have to do factory farming to grow them. No, they couldn't do factory and farming. And so, the, yeah. you know, the, the, if you're... Uh, we're facing a major climate shift. Mm-hmm. A lot of the foods we've relied on aren't going to work anymore. No. A lot of the truck farming, a lot of the transportation, the ch- the idea of cheap, um, you know, cheap anything really, raspberries from Peru flown in or whatnot or wh- wherever. <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. No, uh, a lot of that stuff is it's surreal. gonna it's gonna be inaccessible we, can't keep doing that. we just can't we can't keep doing it and so i mean we're trying to do this here and we have to some extent succeeded but i think everyone's going to need a victory garden yeah and every community is going to need to grow more of the food that the community eats yes and if your community isn't suited to growing corn well, you're not gonna you're not gonna have trucked in a million bags it's of cool. Fritos. No, that's right. Like, yeah, it's you're like gonna, gonna have to grow it. something that you can that but you can grow. eat something that you can grow like locally. That's resilient. That is planted in small patches. That's less subject to um, damage from drought and storms and you know and et cetera, et cetera. And mind you, corn developed in the Americas climate. because it is well adapted to the, the Americas, right? It's well adapted to the, the pre-Anthropocene Americas. America, right. Um, and there are many varieties of corn that aren't part of sure, there American are lots, ag- you know, There are lots of traditional mazes that, where you don't need to p- don't pump need the that. soil full of massive amounts of Roundup or you know, right, or whatever. Any, yeah, yeah. That, that function much, much better uh, in, throughout the Americas. Yeah, yeah. And... I'd like to see those, a resurgence of those, sure, right? right? But largely, our corn industry just needs to go away. It it really it, needs to go it, away. it does, it's and a, we're not bad. we're not you know trying to harm any specific farmers. You no, know. no, I don't, I don't want anybody to lose their job. We maybe. love farmers, but, but maybe we've got change. this. Got to be there's got to be a reckoning and a downshifting in the way that yeah our food is made, and, and you know. Either we go back voluntarily. <laughs> we get taken back. Or we get thrown back. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't think we get a lot of choice about it. No. So this so, fascinating yeah. article. It's yeah. really fascinating. I highly recommend it. Yeah, so I'll include a link in the show notes. Um, okay, so the third topic is... Uh, well, it was about... Um, well, I'm just going to start reading from it. And then yeah, I'll just, stop and just, say... Just dive in. So, five and a half years ago, my wife... Lolly and I 
sat together at a hotel in Las Vegas, nervously composing a coming-out post that would, unbeknownst to us, change our lives in nearly every way imaginable. We were so, so nervous. But we were sweet and earnest, and we had been feeling the cosmic drive to do this for months. We knew, without a doubt, that it was what we were supposed to do, even though it felt totally out of left field, and we had no idea why. Our post went massively viral, and we were featured on shows and newspapers around the world. Yes. So this, the post is that he's talking about was an article about how, by a guy named Josh Weed, mm-hmm. uh, talking about he how he and his wife uh, were in a, what they call a, a mixed orientation marriage. Yes. Uh, they were both uh, Latter-day Saints, LDS, mm-hmm. Mormons. Um, and that they were not, uh, the article, the, their writing was about how they were going to make this work and how it was working, working. for them. How they they'd, had been, a, they'd been together a while. 10 years. Yeah. yeah. How they had a, a wonderful marriage. And Children. even though they knew that Josh was was a gay man, mm-hmm. that she was a heterosexual woman. She was a heterosexual woman. That they were committed to having a, a heterosexual marriage mm-hmm. and raising children together. Yes. This now we talked about this some time ago. We talked about this at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So please remember, five and a half years ago, it's January of. 2018 this was the middle of 2012 yes and the 2012 election cycle right and uh this story came out this uh it went viral and there was lots of talk about it yes and um my take which is you know right possibly wrong but... possibly wrong but my freak take because i always have a freak take yes is was hot take <laughs> i don't do hot takes i don't do no. freak takes yeah freak take um my assertion was, and still is, that this story functioned to normalize the Latter-day Saints for Mitt Romney's campaign. 2012 yes. campaign. Presidential campaign. Because <laughs> this article, so you've got to understand contextually, Latter-day Saints are like a, they were understood to be a sect or a cult. In American yeah, the, ethos, the, they I when I studied them in college in a class called American Sects and Cults, they were considered a Christian sect. A Christian sect, right? With beliefs that were firmly outside the realm of the mainline Protestant uh, and Catholic churches, mm-hmm. um, but still Christian in nature. Christian in nature, but and Christian in in design and you know like uh, dna right right you know but but outside of of uh right mainstream protestantism yeah and they if you study the lds i mean they they do teach some pretty head scratching things yeah. and they self they, their self-understanding was that they were apart they were they were something yes. apart from yeah uh, mainline protestantism right but for romney's 2012 uh campaign it was important for people to understand for conservatives to embrace a Mormon man, man and not just any Mormon, but like a uh, like a, a committed a, a Mormon bishop. Yeah, like a very very ranking <clears throat> ranking committed member active of the church member of and you know right yeah you know, a church leader yeah right. It took a little. It was a little head scratching for us how American evangelicals, given how much like. Um, influence they have yeah. in politics were just like oh well okay yeah yeah magic underwear is fine yeah. no, no not an issue and I really noticed that this was not the only article like this where yes some outrageous to most ears assertion is made right and in the background by the way we're just mainline Christians like every we're just mainline Protestants like everyone right. else right the, so you make some outrageous claim about your um mixed orientation marriage so and in the background oh yes we're just a we're mainline protestant mormons like everyone else so the idea in your freak take is that yeah the the uh the gay community needs to be reassured that the uh the lds aren't any more more homophobic than 
the mainline Christian churches. Well, that, that was part of it, but mo- mostly that it was more like more of a um, sort of it was more of setting the Overton window around moving Mo- Mormons into the Overton window. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what I, that, that was my freak take. That's what you, what, what you that thought of it. That this was really about, and also it's the traction it gained. I I don't mean to comment on at all on what this couple was doing or not doing. Right. I'm not trying to adv- advance any kind of conspiracy about their actions. Right. But the media response well, sure, and the, the traction. The reason it gained, that it all was promoted. Promoted and got so much traction is because it 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 was one of these many stories in 2012 that yes. moved the Overton window to include to be more inclusive of of, of Mormons. Of Mormons. Um, whom as I understand it prefer to be called referred to as LDS. LDS. So, Latter day Saints. Um yeah, They're commonly called Mormons. That yeah. that was my big takeaway from this article. Yeah, less than anything else it might say about um, queer people was this like bizarre tool it became for <laughs> Romney's campaign, and kind of like a stealth tool. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So I want to continue on a little bit. Um, so carry on. It has been wonderful. The five years since that post have been largely the same as the previous ten years. Deeply wonderful, beautiful years, filled with family connections and love. We've continued to raise our girls. We've built memories. We've grown. We've had family home evenings every single Monday, prayed together every night, and read scriptures together every morning as we eat breakfast as a family. Good God, I'm, I'm happy that we don't have to eat breakfast together <laughs> as a family. <laughs> I can just like sneak out before I have to deal with everyone. <laughs> That's yeah. me. We've gone to church and filled church callings and hung out with friends and taken our girls on approximately 400 million play dates. Mm. That's probably not literally true. Lolly and I have loved each other deeply and generously, and we've woven a tapestry oh God, of beautiful connection and communication together that I dare say stands up against the connection and communication of any marriage anywhere. Skipping ahead a paragraph. I, I'll just say, I feel about that phrase the way I feel about the Salvation Army saying they do the most good. Oh, but yeah. moving right along. Yeah, yeah, I, know. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they, they have a happy marriage. They have a happy marriage. Okay. Today, we need to let you know that Lolly and I are divorcing. See, I, I've never been able to understand that, but go on. Because well, I know people do this. They, they have a great marriage and get divorced for some reason. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. If you because print it out, even single space. This this uh, like essay, thirty page thing. This essay is, is like uh, single space. It's fifteen pages Holy of text. Um, well, he's got a lot to say. He has a lot to say, mm-hmm. and he feels like he needs to explain himself to his blog readers and fans and all I, this because so, yeah. he's run a blog, I guess, for many years. Mm-hmm. And then his wife has stuff to say too. Yeah, because mm-hmm. she has to talk to them to the. Latter-day Saints women who right. read too, right? Right. And then their kids have to weigh in as well. So, so can, can, you know, I'm trying to cut to a, the chase. Give me a too long didn't read. What, what's what's I'm, the well, deal here? I'm, I'm trying to get, get through it here. So he okay. says there's three tributaries of sort of the why. Yeah. The first one, love for the LGBTQ population. Mm-hmm. Uh they said when they came out in 2012, they had very little exposure to other gay people besides myself. Right. Post went viral. We we're thrust into the world of LGBTQ Mormons. See, he calls them Mormons. So, I mean. Okay. Yeah. What we saw as the years moved forward was once inspiring and utterly heartbreaking. Um, basically, what he's saying is as we got to know Mormons, we saw or uh, gay Mormons, mm-hmm. we became aware of just how miserable they were. How, mi- how miserable so many people how, were. Yeah. How miserable so many of them were. Yeah. Um, skipping ahead, uh, um, LGBTQ people aren't, quote, the world, unquote. We aren't outsiders that the Mormon church needs to protect itself from. We are you. We are students sitting in a seminary class and the yes. seminary teacher in front of the class. We are the mm-hmm. hurt youth pouring out his or her heart in a bishop's office. Mm-hmm. And we're sometimes the bishop himself with a painful secret carefully guarded, eating away at his heart. As yeah. our awareness and love of the LGBTQ contingent increased, our hearts were softened to their struggles mm-hmm. and our understanding of the gospel of Christ, of mercy, of the atonement and God's love and intentions for his LGBTQ children were forever altered. Yeah. So that actually seems 
qu- quite fascinating and genuine to me. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I do believe, you know, if you grew up in the church, <laughs> you didn't necessarily, weren't ex- necessarily exposed out gay people, right? <laughs> right. But you likely weren't. Yes. yes. So, second tributary. Yeah. Love of self as a gay person. Mm-hmm. Uh, after about three years ago, I finally saw how important it was to love myself, to truly love myself as a gay man. It happened when my dear friend Ben Schaefer, who himself is straight, turned to me one day and said, Josh, you realize your sexual orientation is beautiful, right? Not just tolerable, right? It's right. beautiful. I could hardly even register what he was trying to say. What do you mean? I asked. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. What about the fact that it's a biological aberration, I challenged. I mean, I get that it's not an abomination, like they say when I was a kid. (laughs) (laughs) But what about being something so obviously not what God or biology intended? Right. So, I mean, this was the second tributary. Right. Right. I've always believed, I'm quoting, that I was meant to be straight and God will fix me someday. Mm -hmm. Right, so that I fit in with the rest of his children. I've always believed I was a broken straight person. Oh. And that's, I have to say. That's terrible. That's no way to live. Oh, that's terrible. Um, Then the third tributary, I'm skipping ahead, like, you know, many paragraphs. Uh, The death of my mom. So I'm not going to try and unpack this one completely, but um, somehow... He says, a year and a half ago, his mom's death, it was after her death that we were no longer able to be sexually intimate. Really? So I, it was after her death that we were no longer to be sexually intimate. Uh, grief has that effect on lots of people. But for me, as the months passed, uh, combined with all, all I've recently learned about my own identity, and what God thought of me, and the beauty and legitis- legitimacy of my sexual orientation, I simply was unable to authentically engage in heterosexual sex again. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure exactly how that's tied to his mom, but I think it may have had something to do with, you know, yeah. it felt like he was performing for her, you know, oh, to prove I- himself. Well, there's, there's this thing like some people can't come out until after their parents die. They can't change religion until after or their parents die. Since she's since she's gone, it feels like he can be honest again. He can be honest about yeah, but I'm so yeah. something like that. Um, yeah. So those are the three tributaries, hmm. and then he answers a bunch of questions. Yeah. Um, one of them is in your original coming out post. So much of what you said seemed to align with the Mormon Church's stance on the issue of homosexuality. Is that different now? Is that different now? <laughs> like wow. So then he says, "Oh, look, oh, let's unpack this." Okay. Yeah, yeah. I believed. Um, I've spent my entire life conforming to every standard of the LDS faith because I believed it was what God wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. You know, first of all, I have to say it amazes me that there are adults who still speak and think like that. Right. Well. But I I don't want to maybe shame someone for being more childlike in their belief or faith life, um, because like his writing style yeah is not my writing style and right. it's not one right. that I really connect. No, with. No, I mean I guess but I, yeah. okay amazes me in the sense that wow you never like you never lost faith you never went through a crisis of faith you never started questioning everything about your faith tradition for like well into adulthood. I'm, I, I'm both uh, like, I'm, when I say amazed, I guess it's partly that I'm sort of jealous that that could, really? that could work for a person. That happened. Okay. Like that happens that you're okay with that. Well, it's like, well, that would have been nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not to be racked by, you know, misery and doubt for years. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and to mm-hmm. still, you know, uh-huh. right? I guess, yeah. So, um, I believe this because every mentor, every exemplar, every religious teacher, every therapist, every leader I ever grew up listening to and trusting told me that that was the only way I could return to live with God. There was an emphasis on perfect obedience, and yet over the course of my lifetime, the list of things said by those trusted leaders about my sexual orientation 
was profoundly inconsistent and confusing, right? Oh. <laughs> These individuals told me, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, I'm not going to read the whole list, but they told yeah. him, one, my sexual orientation wasn't real, two, my sexual orientation was evil, mm. three, abomination, four, tantamount to bestiality and just shy of murder, mm. five, a crime against nature, hmm. six, just a feeling, hmm. seven, very small, merely a temptation or a tendency. Mm-hmm. Seven, or where am I? Eight. Uh, something so huge and dangerous that it led to Sodom and Gomorrah's, Gomorrah's destruction and could lead to the downfall of civilization. <laughs> something that could change in this life if I had enough faith. Mm. A trial to bear. Mm. Something that couldn't change in this life. <laughs> Something that could be managed with faith. Or all the Something above. that could be endured. My own fault. <laughs> yeah. Not okay and needed to be rooted out. Yeah. Okay, because they can't change, but never okay to act on. Mm. Okay to be for, uh, not okay to be referred to as gay, but instead only as same-sex attracted. Yeah. Um, never lead to a person identifying himself or herself with the word gay as a noun. Or okay to be referred to as gay, but under limited circumstances. So anyway, you can see what he's getting at here on and on. He talks about, you know, basically he was just hearing no consistent message. Right. But um, skipping ahead again, uh, around this time, a dear friend of mine, a lesbian I adore, called me. Her voice was clipped and panicked. Josh, I can't, I need your help. I'm thinking of killing myself. I want to die. I can't do it anymore. And mm-hmm. somehow this experience mm-hmm. hammered home to him. And he says in a, uh, a couple of paragraphs later, this is what the church's current stance does to LGBTQIA people. It actually kills them. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. it fills them with self-loathing, internalized homophobia, and then provides little to no help when the psychosomatic symptoms kick in. That's yeah. interesting. I hadn't really th- I talked about the psychosomatic somatic sim- symptoms of this like self self loathing, right? right. Um, they had to manifest somehow. Right. right. Yeah. Instead of reacting to this unexpected byproduct, uh, it's supposed to bring immeasurable joy, right? Living the gospel isn't supposed to bring misery and death. It's supposed to bring immeasurable do- joy. joy. Aphorisms like have more faith or have an eternal perspective or be grateful. The LGBTQIA person is left even further alone, now having been shamed by having it implied that their unhappiness and lack of health is their own fault because they aren't being righteous enough or trying hard enough. And so they try harder and they get sicker. Their anxiety mounts up, their psychosomatic symptoms. Sick pathological spiral. Uh, What amounts to the very crux of the problem? The church deprives them, us, of attachment, a natural, verified, studied reaction to an attachment blockade, like being told you can't, you, you're not allowed to attach to the people you're attracted to romantically, to form romantic bonds, um, mm-hmm. is suicidality. When mm-hmm. you're, mm-hmm. when you're told you can't be with the, the person you feel love for. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but. Um, uh, something about denial, something about, uh, he's asked specifically, he's doing a Q and a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you fall in love with someone? Was there infidelity? Dun, dun. And he actually says, uh, that's a personal question, but no, but actually no. there was not a specific, you know, person that he found himself attracted to that led them to hash out this decision. Right. All right. So I'm not going to read all her response although i think if you read this i mean read her response too because she's an important person in this story right you know but uh, but i'm not going to read all that but um it's just too long anyway it's an interesting story it's It's interesting that it came to this well it's it's i'm glad to have the follow-up because i remember at the time people being like uh how's that How's that going to work out? Well, you know, here we are. And um, this story has legs beyond uh, the Latter-day Saints. Yes, it does. But beyond the the Mormon community. Yeah, yeah. And all of these groups uh, 
sh- need to confront these questions in yeah. in thinking about how they practice their faith, how they shape their theology, how they shape their teaching, and mm-hmm. how the the human aspect of you know how do you make your faith, your church teachings, humane to people who are in your church. <laughs> Yeah. Who identify, you know. Yeah. So, um. I, I think, so So they're getting divorced because. They they have agreed to become divorced. Right. Because, I mean, I can't, it's, it's like, okay, I'm supposed to summarize 15 page. Uh, yeah, does it, do, do they, is it, is it a reason? They, they have come to agree that it's not healthy for him to not be able to express his authentic uh, romantic attachments to men and to continue to uh, uh, have like a damaged, you know, sort of not functional sexual relationship with his wife. They, they talk more about this like, well... And in the comments section, there's an awful lot of talk about how, well, do you literally define a marriage based on whether you can produce children, you know, right? or whether you can engage in the physical act of sex? And there's some back and forth about that. Yeah, is that what it's about? And or what? I'm not going to take try and take that all apart, but that's that's part of the debate. I mean, it's 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 a it's a pretty fraught. Um, yeah, no, it's a fraught subject. Subject, you know, and I don't claim to understand all their motivations or to have right. even finished the entire 15 page <laughs> articles <laughs> yeah so but th- they're getting divorced because they've decided jointly that this is a that it's unhealthy for him it's unhealthy it's unhealthy for him marriage, right? it's bad and, for their marriage it's bad for everything they're doing yeah and, and is it unhealthy for her um you don't know here, or, talk amongst yourselves i'll try to find a quote from her section we'll cut this part out let's okay so let's do music for everyone here we go let's let lolly well that's copyrighted (gasps) oh i'm sorry it's not like i don't ever throw copyrighted music in the podcast let's let lolly speak for herself hi guys lolly here stop that (laughs) sorry (laughs) I hate the way they just drop in in someone else's voice, you know, like writing your blog. Yeah. Why don't you just put it in italics or something? Um, sharing the deepest parts of my heart, just like last time, back in September, Josh and I realized together, crying in each other's arms, that the best thing for both of us and our children would be to end our marriage. It was heartbreaking, and it was not a decision we took lightly. Mm-hmm. For me, giving my whole heart to Josh while knowing that he did not love me the way a man loves a woman... Well, this is like one way a man loves a woman, you know, (laughs) has always been devastating. We were best friends, but he never desired me. He never adored me. He never longed for me. People who read our previous post might be confused because we mentioned having a robust sex life. Yeah. Um, That was true. We put forth a lot of effort. (laughs) (laughs) They put in the time and the effort. They did the work. And were mechanically quote mechanically unquote good at sex Mm -hmm. and it did help us to feel intimate and for a time that closeness did help us to feel content in our sex life but i don't remember him ever looking at me with passion in his eyes well part of me wants to say uh, that's actually the passion part to me i mean the passion is nice i guess but in a long-term marriage, the passion often kind of is, to me, like the affection and intimacy is more important than the yeah. literally passion. I don't, I, I'm not trying to like denigrate anybody's anything anywhere. To judge anybody's marriage. Yeah, but for me, it's, it's all in the way you scrub the stove, babe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, for all the gentlemen who may be listening, <laughs> you want to get your wife looking at you like a snack? Oh, <laughs> scrub that stove. It's like a 
beef jerky and she's uh she oh. hasn't eaten in three days yeah scrub the stove scrub take the, stove. the take the burners off take scrub the, burners the trays off. get it down po- under get yeah. that shit polished and gleaming yeah <laughs> that's the stuff right there <laughs> But you know that's that's me. That's me. You know, in my that's own near, freak fetishes. Uh, <laughs> that's me. I, just to clarify, we we have a very fulfilling marriage. I, I think so. However, with six young kids at home, it's not often about the marathon. You know, it's not about the passion. Uh, yeah, the, it's not the, about the, feeling like, the love. We're gonna have you know. Now, babe, I'm gonna seduce you, and we're gonna spend six hours making sweet love. <laughs> Yeah, no, something like that. It, it, um, you know, that that'd be nice if That's we had cool. a babysitter or something, <laughs> or something. <laughs> but you know, usually what happens if we get a sitter is we're just like, I'm so tired. I'm, I'm just gonna take like, a nap. I'm just gonna take a nap. Like, oh, First, I'm gonna look at the stove, and then I'm gonna I'm take gonna a clean nap. The stove, and then pass out. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but we, I, I'm very satisfied with our marriage. I just have to say, yeah, and sexually I, and and many o- many, many other, other ways. ways. Yeah. And you're on a date with us, so you can hear how so we can, interact. Yeah. Um, but so she goes on, uh, says, you guys have such a special, her sister-in-law uh, says, you guys have a special relationship. You're intimate in so many ways. Believe me, sex is not worth throwing away the connection you two have. And she, what then she says, uh, she gets a little more specific. She says, Josh has never looked at me with romantic love in his eyes. He has never touched me with the sensitive touch of a lover. Whenever he held me in his arms, it was a love that was similar to the love of a brother to a sister. Hmm. Like, uh, huh. okay. Uh, okay. It does eventually take its toll on your self-esteem. No matter how much I knew why, I couldn't res- he couldn't respond to me in the way a lover responds to a partner. It wears a person down as if you're not good enough to be loved in that way. What I didn't realize is that as human beings, we actually need to feel loved in that way with our partners. Uh, People vary. I I, I think that's personal. I I don't. I don't think that's true of every person. But that's people. They're they're so you know this whole thing is about understanding that there's that there's a lot of. That there's there's variation, variation in human sexuality, but then like that variation, then she's making an absolute blank statement like that. Yeah. So I, I, so I think she gets to talk about what's true for her. What's true for her, and, and it's true for her because she's the authority on that. And I, I personally, I mean, I've never met these people, right? Yeah. I only know them as this freak show bloggers, right? But right. Uh, um, <laughs> freak <could> talk. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but um. I feel sad whenever I hear about a divorce. Yeah. Because I, I divorce was, was a terrible trauma in my life, my yeah. childhood. It changed my life for the worse. Yeah. And, you know, you can argue whether or not ultimately it was... For the best. I was oh, better oh, off yeah, or it, what. It's a good open question. But it's a hard thing. And it's a, it's a, it's yeah. like a death, you know. Yeah. And so I, I really, I don't want to advocate for their divorce exactly. But I also I'm going to cede to them the authority to decide what's right for them. For them and their know? family, but yeah, but I can't I can't really advocate. I can't really endorse this course exactly, which yeah. well, like like they sounds, asked us, right? But like they asked us, but which maybe sounds strange because I I am for people seeking out their own emotional health, and yeah. I am for gay people coming out and. Living not in denial and, and developing living self-esteem, honestly. living yeah. honestly yeah. and whatnot. I'm for all that. But a divorce is still a... a it's a divorce. It's, it's like a, a divorce. It's like a death. And I'm not... Yeah. I, but, you know, again, I'll cede to them. They're like they're I ever had anything to say about them, but just re- re- reaffirm their authority to decide what to do with their lives. And then there's more. They talk to the, about the kids, Yeah. too. Yeah, my goodness. So. But... Wow. As the years went by and the holes in our souls grew larger and larger, we realized that our relationship was not like an elderly couple because although the elderly couple's sexual relationship had dimmed, their romantic adoration for one another did not. So that's maybe hmm. a take on, well, why can't you guys just be romantic even if, you know... I, I guess I, I'm... Like you don't give them an erection, <laughs> to be blunt, you know? I, I'm... I'm not really a romantic person. Yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, I, I think there are things you've done for me that I found to be very romantic. Romantic. But I don't know that any person would comprehend how it's romantic. <laughs> so. <laughs> the microscope. Yeah, I'm thinking of the microscope. Like no one. So for for my birthday one year, you gave me a microscope. Yes. And. And an award. And an award. <laughs> and there's a backstory, and I'll tell it sometime. But. No one could comprehend precisely why you would give me a microscope for my birthday. And why why you would consider that to be a really lovely, oh, just lovely gift. A pinnacle lifetime. Let's, oh, wow, that's perfect. <laughs> right? And I was so excited and so in love with this and thought it was marvelous, right? But the, the reason I, I got this for you was because I knew the backstory. Because you knew the backstory, and right? I, I, yeah, and I was trying to do something for you that you wouldn't do for yourself, but that you would appreciate, and that you know it had to do with who you are and what your interests were and what your history was. Right. And you can't explain all that to someone else outside. Out from someone outside. But the fact that I knew all that is why it was romantic. Is why it was romantic, right? Yes. So I'm. So I may, maybe maybe we have a different understanding of what romance is. Right. Because, frankly. My <laughs> friends, to whom I am not married, right, do things like that for me all the time. Right, right, <laughs> right. So I, so maybe we un- understand romance okay, differently, or I don't know, um, whatever you want to call it. Well, yeah, maybe it's I don't know. There's some other word that we're not we're not jibing on. But yeah, yeah. Well, so then again, a lot, and this goes on for many more pages. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of what she's talking about is this. This is this wanting to feel loved romantically and why this yeah. is important and why it's important for her and how she didn't feel like she could just accept um, not having that. Not having that, yeah. You know, well, if, and that, even if all the other things were wonderful. All the other things were wonderful. All the other things were there. That wasn't enough for her. And that's... Oh, and that makes sense. I, I'm just... I understand all the things he's saying about his experience. I'm just wondering what's happening for, for her in this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and so the, there's a section where they talk about do they tell their their girls and she the the wife tells the story and it, it gets into this uh, they talk about the book Stella Luna yeah yeah right and I'm not going to read all that but I mean you but can, yeah you can read it there's they're using um let's see let me find a summary here uh, the first time I read this to Anna I had no idea what the book was about. When I finished it, I felt absolutely sick in my heart because I could instantly see the parallels between Stella Luna and Josh. Josh was a bat trying to be a good bird. Yeah. I knew that he didn't want to eat bugs and he wanted to hang upside down. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone around him told him it was wrong. He was gay, trying to live a straight life. That is the essence of internalized homophobia, trying to be something you're not because you think it's bad or wrong. Mm-hmm. Religion told us that homosexuality is bad and wrong. But I started wondering if these beliefs were a result of our heteronormative culture. Like in Stella Luna, the birds thought flying at night was bad, and they were right. Right. It was bad for them because they were not made to fly at night, but a fruit bat was born to fly at night. (laughs) So uh, this is part of how she explained this situation to To her her daughters was using this 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 children's book. Right, it's a a good metaphor. So... um, yeah, but no, I actually the the um, reminds me of of um certain folks who get to a certain point in their lives and their marriages, usually middle age. And I don't think this is them. But uh this couple that in this story, but they're like they're they're all kind of like I want the romance back or what have you. You know, I want, you know. And they're kind of grasping at something that I think at least at least for me in my experience mm-hmm. is not really what marriage is about I think uh, there's like the cultural norm about what marriage is about there's church right. teachings about what marriage is about and should be about about what an ideal marriage is and all this right and there's what you come to agree on as what your marriage is about. Your marriage is about what you're, for what you're you. doing. Yeah. And those things, there has to be some, you know, Venn diagram of congruence <laughs> between them, right? <laughs> they have to line up somehow. But they don't have to be identical. No, I don't think they have to be identical. But I do think there is this other problem. That's, and again, beyond 
the boundaries of their marriage or our marriage yeah. or this couple in this particular story. Yes. Um, we don't really have a shared idea about what marriage is anymore. Culturally, across yeah. the culture. We have no, no. cultural notion of what no. it is. Um, it's, and it's much no. like how we have no shared cultural notion of what parenting is. Yeah. And that's why we can't do it together. Yeah. That's why... Yeah. Well, you have to call the cops if you see someone parenting Right, wrong. right. And that that's why, like, you know, it's okay now for, for like, uh, people who have families like ours, it's completely okay to mock and ostracize them for having all these kids. Because the kids. Because, you know. Because yeah. it's, not, it's not important. It's not like it's important. Like, it's just selfish. Like, just selfish. You got all these dogs, you it's know? It's like collecting vintage cars Mars. or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Or like, you know, hoarding puppies or whatever you're <laughs> Well, they do sleep in a puppy pile. <laughs> you know, sometimes we find that if the boys are, you know, wake up, had a bad dream, and are lonely, they'll just like snuggle with snuggle, each other, and we'll find them all pile. piled in the bed. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at the little puppy. It's very sweet, actually. Yeah, okay, it is, yeah. uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote one or one or two more little bits here. Yeah, because he he winds it up, well, st- um, or nearly winds it up with a section called an apology. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Josh again. We have some things we want to apologize for. And yeah. for me, part of this is just like, you know, who who knew this, this could be complex? Right? <laughs> yeah. We're sorry for some of the things we said in our original coming out post in 2012. There are several ideas in that post that, though well-meaning, we now realize stemmed from internalized homophobia. We're sorry, so incredibly sorry, for the ways our post has been used to bully others. Oh, and yeah. I think this is important because yeah, that, you know I, church yeah. leaders could then use this as a norm, right? To say, right. See? "See, here's a gay man, but he's doing the right it's thing." Saying, right. It, be, it became a cudgel. Yeah, a, a cudgel. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think I. I saw that angle of it and didn't even want to touch it with a ten foot pole. It, no, but it leapt out it, to me. It leapt out as a media thing, but yeah, right. But that it also could become a, a church thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, Catholics are are uh, don't really like pointing to the Mormons as an example, but sometimes do. Yeah. Oh, did I do something wrong? Just a second. I have to look at the computer. I think it may have stopped recording. I'll be right. <laughs> Are we still on? Is it still a thing? It hasn't been recording for the last hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It's fine. It's just I, I can't see the screen very well from where I'm standing. And um, and we've had this problem before where like a couple times podcasts have just gone wrong. Right. <laughs> We're little... like just stopped recording. We're still talking. Hey, we had this great, great conversation. conversation. Now I'm going to go upload it. It's like, what? what? Oh, God. Right. Hey, really, that only has to happen once to kind of freak Ugh. you out a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, but this became a cudgel. Yeah. It became a cudgel. We're sorry to any gay Mormon who received criticism, backlash, or hatred as a result of our story. It wasn't long after our post that we began to get messages from the LBTQ, LBGTQIA the community, QIA community yeah. okay. letting us know that their loved ones were using our blog post to pressure them to get married to a person of the opposite gender, sometimes even disowning them, saying things like, if these two can do it, so can, can you. you. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. we're scrolling down a little bit. Um, we're sorry to anyone who felt a measure of false peace because of our story. Hmm. There are many people who have good hearts who were grappling with the issue of homosexuality before we came out, who were having a difficulty reconciling the church they loved with the things they knew about their gay loved ones. Yeah. Our coming out post gave a false hope. See? I just knew there had to be a way for gay people to stay true to their faith by denying themselves and live a happy, healthy life. Mm-hmm. We're, we're sorry to s- perhaps send you back to the state of confusion you were in before you saw our story. But at the same time, that state of confusion is necessary. Mm-hmm. So something is wrong. It doesn't add up. As I've said in thousands of prayers over the last half decade, as I've come to know more and more LGBTQ. LGBTQIA individuals and the ways they've been hurt as well as have realized the impossibility of a God that would set up a plan that's totally impossible for page break here 
for a huge segment of his children to participate in, yeah. all within a church whose policies and positions assert that this is exactly what God has done. Something yeah. is wrong. Something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, is is it? Do people use queer anymore? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Because I don't know. I've. You can't say all this. <laughs> I always just say queer. Well, what's become confusing for me is that. It was LGBT and LGBTQ, and now it's LGBTQIA. Yeah. Uh, it seems like every time I see it used, there's more letters on the end, and I, I can't even I don't well, even know for sure what they are all. And maybe stand I'm, for. maybe I'm old fashioned. I've been calling it queer for like the last twenty five years. Right? Well, you know? maybe you know. I think you're you're again ahead of the curve, having been behind the curve for so long. Apparently, but if you add enough uh, letters to the acronym, people are just going to stop using, using it. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I. Yeah. Well, queer is in there. So, les- is lesbian, gay, transgendered, bisexual, LGBT? No, uh, Q bisexual, que- trans- transgendered. Q is questioning in that. Oh, it's questioning? Yes. Oh, I thought that was queer. <laughs> no, questioning, intersex, and uh, oh, asexual. Intersex- oh, intersex and asexual. asexual. Yeah. Okay. So, shows- so, I've. But rather than try just- to stumble all that out, I just say queer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That seems a lot easier. Yeah. Whether that's offensive or not, I can't really say. I, I, I really don't think it is. I, I mean, if it is, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't mean to be offensive. Uh, um, just say, please you know, just correct person, me. Uh, person experiencing an alternative sexual reality or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's an alternative sexual reality. <laughs> But but queer, I think the, is perfectly uh, yeah non non normative non cis non you know. Uh, okay. just, stop, just stop, just stop, just stop. Yeah, no, I I think that I think, you think queer, queer covers, covers, covers all of that. that. I that, don't know. You, know. you know what? Leave a comment if you think it's okay to 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 use the word queer instead of this long acronym. The long acronym, right? Uh, um. I don't. Yeah. I don't have a dog in this fight particularly. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I can see people getting annoyed at having to learn a new acronym every, or grow the acronym every year or two. But, but I don't particularly care. I'll do the best I can. But I will stumble over it. Unfortunately, trying to read it. Also, it's not even consistently used in this article. I should say. Oh, even the right. articles they didn't, used the right. same way they didn't even like search and replace to make it read the same everywhere. So, right. uh, anyway, okay. So, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have like a a summary take, a summary take, or a real takeaway, a take home, or you know, except that you know, sexuality is complicated, and yeah. I, I think it always was. A, a, it's always been complicated. It always will be. It always is, and always will be, and. Um, you know, as Kurt Vonnegut said, damn it, you've got to be kind. You yeah. know, be kind yeah. to people. And don't use any teaching or any judgment as a cudgel against people or something that works for you. Don't use that as a cudgel. Right. I feel pretty satisfied with what works for me in our yeah. marriage. Um, and I don't think I'm going to... Uh, Quite hits, universal like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm going to hit some magical age and be like, you know what? I've always actually <laughs> always wanted romance. I, I want more romance in my life, and that's why I'm uh, going to join the know, circus. Or something. <laughs> I don't need. I I, can't, I don't even. I know. can't even right. because you know my life's not really that. Never been that much about romance. No. No. Yeah. But so, we, yeah. we do have six children together, and I, you know, yeah, uh, you know, I'm a horny bugger, so <laughs> that's. <laughs> I don't know if you're as horny as I am. There's well, anyway, but, but so that, I mean that aspect of our life is you know functions the way you might expect, but um, but it is. But there's so much more, right? There's so much more, and it really, we can't get hung up on the fact. That we're not in our twenties. We're not in our twenties, and that we have a lot of pressures on our time, right? You know, right? And sometimes, the most satisfying thing sometimes Mm -hmm. is just, you know, 
just turn off the light and snuggle up to your wife and like yeah, and kiss you on the shoulder and say i love you i'm too tired to do anything but kiss you on the shoulder and pass out good pass night out. good night and that like it's falling asleep together is deeply satisfying deeply satisfying rewarding yes so uh, yeah so that, but that's you know that's us in our lives yeah yeah but we're i'm not going to prescribe so what other people need to do what other people should do but uh, but i think this is a good read and i think oh it's, yeah i think it's it sounds like it's really worthwhile worth yeah reading. and it's salutary i think to go back if you haven't read the original go back and read the original read the original mm-hmm. and then read now and think about how this stuff gets politicized used and abused right and how it gets churned yeah for the news cycle yeah okay well, I think that's a wrap. I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Leave a comment if you've got a comment. Uh, we oh, we did. Uh, we got um, Google Hangouts working. Yeah. Which means that we'll we'll have a way for people to to hit a link on their computer or their phone or their iPad or whatever, mm-hmm. and uh, connect up to the podcast, and we'll be able to hear you, and you'll be able to hear us, and we can record that way. Yeah, so you can be a guest on the show if you uh, would like to be. You can be a guest on the show. So we're going to approach some people about about um, doing guest spots guest to talk spots. about specific uh, issues. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. All right. Have a good week, guys. Bye-bye.